This video is on the 2024 World Happiness Report, which was just published. We're gonna run through some of the uh, insights, trends, and three of the key questions, and of course, some answers uh, that come out of this report. So let's get into it. I will include references down below to the full report. I encourage you to check it out. It's nice, they offer both a initial kind of summary of the first few chapters, uh, and then of course, the very in-depth report, which if you're like a research nerdy type like me, you'll dig. So I'll highlight a few, maybe the five biggest insights and trends. So this was interesting. We see a sharp negative trend for young people, particularly in the West. So historically you see happiness following what they sometimes call a U-shaped curve, right? So you can imagine it going like this or maybe uh, slightly less steep, almost more of like a V. And what tended to be the case is that early in life, people had higher levels of happiness and this gradually declined towards middle age. And then it sort of recovered and people at the end of life were quite happy. And now of course there's some uh, variation in that in terms of regions and things like that. But we see is since around 2008, happiness among young people age 15 to 24 has fallen to where actually young people are now less happy than older people. So basically you think of it being kind of like this U or V and now it's more like this or even some cases at the lowest and just going up. Uh, we see this particularly, as I said, in uh, just North America and the West, but also in Western Europe as well. Next insight. They did some interesting research here to kind of disentangle generational cohort effects to see that people born after 1980 across the board have a lower level of happiness. So it's not just like a generational thing, but across all these groups, if you're born after 1980, you tend to be less happy compared to prior generations. We see a troubling trend since 2006, there has been a large increase in the inequality of happiness in every single region except Europe. This is especially true for older populations and global happiness inequality has increased by more than 20% over the past 12 years. What that means is just like what it sounds when people talk about income inequality, it's the gap between the rich and the poor. Happiness inequality is saying that happy people are getting happier while less happy people are staying or even in some cases getting less happy. And so they're sort of splitting that chasm between the haves and the have nots in this case with respect to happiness, which is kind of troubling. Uh, negative emotions are more frequent now than in 2006 to 2010 everywhere except in East Asia and Europe. And then finally, COVID-19 crisis led to a worldwide increase in the proportion of people who have helped others. Uh, this increase in altruism or benevolent behavior, which is like uh, other prioritizing behavior, has been significant across all generations, but especially for people born after 1980. So we see that in response to COVID, and maybe this even goes against some of what the kind of narratives are, uh, younger people especially were actually more pro-social, uh, more altruistic, more benevolent, looking out for other people, et cetera. So those are a few of the insights and we'll talk a little bit more about some questions that arose out of this. But first I wanna share with you some of the rankings. So let's go into the top 10. So these are your country rankings by life evaluation from 2021 to 2023. And I should share how they, the researchers break down life satisfaction or life evaluation. They use primarily something called a Cantrill ladder. That's C-A-N-T-R-I-L, ladder. Uh, it's like the thing you climb up. And what that asks people to do is basically say, hey, imagine a ladder uh, from one being like the worst possible life to 10 being the best possible life. Where are you at on that ladder? And so it's meant to be a single item that captures people's evaluation of their own lives. So that's what we do with this. So country rankings, we have number one, Finland, number two, Denmark, number three, Iceland, number four, Sweden, number five, Israel, number six, Netherlands, seven, Norway, eight, Luxembourg, nine, Switzerland, 10, Australia, 11, New Zealand, 12, Costa Rica, my birthplace, good work team, 13, Kuwait, 14, Austria, 15, Canada. Now I'm gonna break here, jump down to number 22. So you just went from 15 to 22. United Arab Emirates, 23, United States, 24, Germany. 
We'll break again. I just wanted to share that for you because I know a lot of you are watching this in the US. Drop down now to the, the bottom five, 39. We have the Congo. 140 is Sierra Leone. 141 is Lesotho. 142 is Lebanon. And 143 is Afghanistan. Now, as we look at this, there are, of course, a few questions that come out of this. I think the first one being, well, what makes people happy? Like, where do these numbers come from? And the national average life evaluations are actually explained in terms of six key variables. So again, these life evaluations that are averaged out across entire countries, the researchers have found that six variables account for more than three fourths of the variation in these scores. And so again, what that means is that these six things predict the vast majority of those outcomes. Uh, and interestingly, the kind of model they developed as they've gotten more data over the last three years, the predictive power of these six variables has increased, which basically suggests that they're on the right track. Like there's a lot of validity to these six things. And now I'm gonna list them in order of importance. Number one is having someone to count on. This is like social support. Number two, freedom from corruption. This relates closely with number three, freedom to make life choices. Number four, GDP per capita. That's kind of like the uh, economic productivity and abundance, but per person. That's where the per capita comes from. Number five, generosity. And number six, healthy life expectancy. And now you might ask too, well, how are some countries happy with less, right? We just said like, these are some of the things that matter, but how is it, for instance, Costa Rica, who has a GDP per capita of only $12,472, is 11 spots ahead of the US, whereas the US has a GDP per capita of $70,241. So we're talking about a difference there of over $50,000 per person. So this report doesn't give a certain explanation, but I think when we look at those above six variables, remember that really the majority of those have more to do with cultural norms and cultural values and lifestyle than they do money, right? So this idea of how much does your culture value and facilitate close social relationships and a sense of social connection, huge factor. And then to what extent do you feel free from corruption? And then kind of having the freedom to make life choices too. I think that um, those are gonna be, again, more powerful than GDP alone. So I think that when we think about, well, how is it that some of these countries are almost like better, so to speak, at doing more with less or having more happiness from less resources, I think we have to go back to that old adage that uh, do not mistake standard of living for quality of life. There are cultural and social factors, perhaps even environmental factors that matter more than just your material wealth and affluence. Finally, interesting question uh, that was asked by a radio show host that was going on uh, to talk about this today. Well, COVID-19, uh, excuse me, I got ahead of myself. So what is driving the youth happiness crisis or the youth happiness decline in North America? And for this, I actually turned my attention away from the report a little bit. And I'm gonna draw primarily on the research of social scientist, Jonathan Haidt. He's a psychologist who's been working on this topic for a number of years now. And what we do see is that COVID-19 seems to have played a role in diminishing happiness. There's compelling research to suggest that pretty much across the board, across regions, uh, youth happiness has declined as, as a result of the pandemic and lockdowns, et cetera. But what Jonathan Haidt points to, and again, I'll reference this down below his upcoming book, is a perfect storm, so to speak, where you have two factors that are going against the mental health of young people. Again, we're talking here particularly in the West, so North America and Western Europe. We see first a decline in play-based childhood and a rise in phone-based childhood. So first, what we can understand is that in the 2010s, there was something that happened that triggered a surge of anxiety and depression, especially around 2012. This uh, when you kind of look at it, even when you control for other social and environmental factors, this seems to coincide pretty clearly with the advent and emergence of going from flip phones to smartphones and then the proliferation of social media and unlimited data. And so we see in the 
80s going into the 90s, kind of setting up the foundation for this. First of all, extreme declines in play. And now this maybe doesn't sound all that much of a powerful insight at first, but the truth is that for all mammals, particularly primates, that's us, uh, play is an essential mechanism for the development of the brain, and particularly social emotional learning. Okay, so we see a decline in play already, which is hindering child development. And then at the same time, we see a rise in cell phones. And so this is going into the late 2000s, into the early 2010s. And what we see is that tech companies deliberately design their apps and social media products to be addictive, basically preying on the attention of young people, further distorting things like self-perception, uh, damaging social development and social relationships, and ultimately cognitive uh, development as well. And so what we see is those two factors come together to uh, more than just the COVID-19 pandemic and certainly more than just, oh, these young kids are not tough or, uh, oh, all kids go through things or, you know, there's this sort of perception that every generation thinks younger generations are stupid or worse off or something. And historically, that's often been the case. But in this case, we see actual material distinct differences in the happiness and mental health of younger generations, which there is a fairly strong case when we examine the literature that suggests that is driven by declines in play and increase in phone based childhoods, essentially, and interaction, etc. So this report continues to be a valuable tool when we look at the state of affairs with respect to happiness in the world. We see threats to youth mental health, particularly in developed Western cultures, uh, as well as the threat of inequalities in happiness, right? Again, we talked about that stratification of, it seems as though uh, happiness and equality is becoming more extreme over the past 20 years. Uh, we continue to see though, that happiness is not fixed. There are significant changes in countries and between countries every single year, which on one hand is a cautionary note that our cultural values and policy are very important and so they should not be taken lightly. But it's also an optimistic note or a hopeful note that we can, through the intentional development and research of happiness and programs and policies and initiatives, et cetera, that support happiness and flourishing, we can in fact become happier at these large scale regional and societal levels. And then finally, we were reminded again, as we look at some of the interesting case studies, like my country, my second country, or my first country, you could argue Costa Rica, uh, that making a good living is not the same thing as making a good life. That while GDP and economic affluence certainly are quite important, things like close social relationships, uh, freedom from corruption and freedom to make your own life choices and things you value are often more important than your standard of living. So I hope this video was helpful as always for science-based tools, as well as lessons and insights from the study of happiness. You can check out my channel as I work towards building my own happiness PhD. Uh, you can find a video that YouTube thinks you'll recommend here. Again, references are down below and I hope you enjoyed. That's all for now. I'll see you in the next time. This has been Jackson Kirchis, your happiness nerd. Thanks for watching.